Dimax Tech Tip, Validating a Flood Curing Process. This Tech Tip presentation includes a brief introduction to light cure systems and then is broken into two sections, Part 1, Validating a Flood Cure System, and Part 2, Process Control. There are many benefits to using integrated light cure systems in manufacturing. When optimized to work together, the systems are significant drivers for improving productivity, minimizing risk, enhancing quality, and increasing efficiency. Today, integrated light care systems are used across many industries because of their ability to reduce overall process costs. The basic components of an integrated light caring system consist of a light careable material, dispensing system, and curing energy source, such as a spot, flood, or conveyor. The key to a successful process is ensuring a compatible match between all the components. For this reason, the best consultants to work with are the companies that design, manufacture, and sell all three. They have the technical expertise to make sure the entire process is compatible and will run smoothly without any problems. Once an adhesive, dispensing method, and curing system is selected, the process must be qualified prior to production startup and then continuously maintained during actual production. Validating a curing process is essential to its success and is different for each style curing system. Once a manufacturer has identified the adhesive best suited for the application, the amount of adhesive in each bond, and the light curing system they will be using, they will need to specify the exposure time and an acceptable intensity range. The following validation process is suggested to determine the exposure time and intensity range required. Part 1, Validating a Flood Care System. For manufacturers using a UV visible light curing flood lamp in their production line, there are four key steps to validating the system. One, define full cure. Two, determine minimum intensity and exposure time. Three, determine the safety factor. And four, define the upper intensity limit. Step one, define full cure. Identify a parameter or group of parameters that can be practically measured to indicate full cure. Full cure is defined as the point at which additional cure time or additional intensity no longer improves the physical properties of a cured, like curable material. Physical properties of the cured adhesive or coating are most often used for measurement and correlation to full cure. Commonly used criteria include bond strength, hardness, and surface tack. Measurements are typically made on parts that have returned to room temperature after curing exposure cycle. Step two, determine minimum intensity and exposure time. Users can determine the minimum intensity and exposure time to achieve full cure in one of two ways. One, set the exposure time and vary the intensity to determine the minimum intensity, or two, set the intensity and determine the minimum exposure time. Method one, set the exposure time and vary the intensity to determine minimum intensity. Exposure time is selected first to avoid creating a bottleneck in the assembly process. This is also called the tack time with manufacturers that use lean practices. Within most manufacturing processes, there is a rate limiting step that dictates throughput. If exposure time is not slower than the rate limiting step, it will not be the bottleneck. If the minimum intensity associated with the chosen exposure time results in unacceptable bulb life, either a higher intensity curing system or multiple curing systems may be required. Method two, set the intensity and determine the minimum exposure time. The processing intensity is selected first to provide acceptable curing energy source life. This option would be selected if tack time was not as much of a concern as maximizing usable curing unit life. If the minimum exposure time associated with the chosen intensity is considered too long, a higher intensity or multiple curing systems may be required. Distance must be a constant. The distance between the curing energy source and target cure area must remain a constant for all methods of measurement. This is a key factor in process control as curing energy levels quickly decrease over distance. As the source degrades, 
the distance to the bond line may need to be reduced to elevate the intensity, as explained later during the process control section in Part 2. Height adjustments made in the curing distance should be recorded and maintained. Validated complete cure. Determining the minimum intensity required for full cure in a specific application requires empirical testing. This testing typically involves measuring some physical property indicative of cure, adhesion or hardness, for example, while varying either exposure time or intensity. Figure 1 shows how this testing might be accomplished by setting exposure time and varying intensity. Some of today's light carrying flood systems allow users to adjust intensity manually. Understanding the intensity mapping with your light source. Not all flood units emit a consistent energy across the illuminated area. If you're curing multiple parts in a fixture or on a pallet, you should take several intensity readings to understand if there are high and low intensity points. This may mean defining minimum intensity based on the low areas. Step 3. Determine the safety factor. A safety factor helps to ensure that the UV curing process can withstand unavoidable variations in the parts and process. As applications and manufacturing environments can vary significantly, it remains the responsibility of the user to assess and establish the minimum intensity limits and safety factors. Apply a safety factor to the minimum intensity defined in Step 2 earlier to determine the lower intensity limit. For example, if the minimum intensity required to cure an assembly within 5 seconds is 75 milliwatts per centimeter squared, the lower intensity limit would be 113 milliwatts per centimeter squared with a 50% safety factor. Step 4. Define the upper intensity limit. Determine the highest intensity that still produces acceptable parts within a specified time frame without causing damage to the bonded substrates or resins, typically caused by overheating. This intensity may or may not exceed the maximum intensity of the UV curing system employed. The UV light curing process now has both a lower and upper intensity specification and employs a safety factor as shown in Figure 2 below. Following these four steps, a flood cure system user can be very confident that the appropriate cycle time and carrying intensity range has been established for the specific application under consideration. Part 2, Process Control. Once a process is validated, it's important for manufacturing to operate within its defined limits. There are several steps to consider when developing a controlled flood carrying process. They include monitoring intensity, adjusting intensity, documenting the process, and eliminating and or understanding possible variations. Monitor intensity. Measuring intensity requires a radiometer like the Dymax AccuCal 50 or AccuCal 160. A radiometer measures intensity over a specified range of wavelengths. The intensity of a flood system is best measured at the focal point of the lamp reflector. Recording intensities is necessary to document that the health of the curing system and process is operating within the limits set during the validation. The focal point of a Dymax flood lamp is 3 inches beneath the bottom of the reflector. The focal point for a Fusion I300 MB lamp is 2.1 inches below the bottom of the irradiator. The focal point on a Dymax LED flood lamp is 1 inch below the bottom of the LED array housing. Adjust intensity. Since the intensity from arc ignition lamps tends to drop with time, the intensity set point should be set closer to the upper intensity limit threshold. Step 4 of validation. It should be periodically checked and readjusted. In the standard arc ignition systems, the intensity adjustment is performed by moving the z-axis distance from the bond line. Increasing the distance from the UV source to the bond line will decrease the intensity. The technology in new LED flood carrying systems allows for adjustments in output intensity through the front panel display, leaving the lamp to bond line distance untouched. Document the process. Documentation methods and measurements is a critical aspect of any manufacturing process. 
This documentation should be posted at the workstation, not filed away. Documentation that is readily available is more likely to be followed. Documentation of the following items is strongly recommended. Radiometer and detector serial number, last calibration date, next calibration date. Expected intensity measurement with maximum and minimum limits, set up procedure, exposure time, distance from the part, intensity measurement method and frequency, intensity readjustment method and frequency, and bulb replacement method and bulb change history log. Table 1 shows an example of a UV carrying intensity record that incorporates items A through H as shown on the previous slide. Eliminate or understand possible variations. The more variation that is eliminated from a carrying process, the more controlled the process will be. If a variation cannot be eliminated, it should be understood and worked into the process. We have already mentioned maintaining distance and intensity. Other sources of variation include bulbs, radiometers, radiometer calibration, and measurement calculation. Bulbs, natural variations in the components that construct the bulbs used in light carrying systems will lead to variations in initial intensity output. This will be most noticeable when changing out an old lamp for a new lamp. Lamps also degrade at different rates depending upon their initial intensity and pattern of usage, but all will exhibit similar degradation curves. Radiometers. Dimax AccuCal 50 radiometers consist of a meter and a detector. These two components are calibrated as a matched set. Interchanging a detector between meters will certainly lead to repeated inaccurate measurements that can be wildly out of range. Each detector comes with a graphed spectral response curve specific to that device, like a fingerprint. Radiometer calibration. For all radiometers, the calibration process individually calibrates each radiometer set to a single transfer standard within an acceptable deviation limit. When comparing two radiometers to each other, the stacking of deviations could indicate significant differences in measurement that may seem unacceptable, but each radiometer is in fact accurate when compared to the calibration standard. For this reason, it is strongly recommended for a single radiometer to be used when monitoring the daily activities of a production line. A second radiometer should only be used when the main radiometer is returned for calibration. The radiometers should be compared together to understand what the deviation is between the two units, and it will help the user to understand the difference in measurement they may begin to witness when using the secondary radiometer. Measurement location. Depending on the flood lamp carrying system used, the UV intensity delivered to the bond line can vary across both the X and Y axis, length and width, of the exposed area. Placing the radiometer in the same location every time will provide consistent measurements. To mitigate variations in measurement, a fixture can be used with the radiometer to allow for repeatable placement in the care area, regardless of the technician recording the measurement. It is also important to make sure the intensity measure is recorded at the same z-axis as the bond line. A measurement taken with the radiometer detector 0.5 inches above or below the height of the bond line could produce energy levels drastically different to what the bond line is actually receiving. Our application engineering team is available to assist manufacturers with carrying, dispensing, and adhesive selection, as well as troubleshooting and process assistance. Contact IMAX at 860-482-1010 or visit our website at www.dimax.com.